Hello, everyone. My name is Meyer Thacker. I'm an analyst and senior relationship manager here at Zach's Professional Services. And this is a economic and market valuation update that we've you know, been watching and monitoring over the past several weeks here. And this is continuing our discussion from prior webinars where we have been looking at the CPI index and its historically high reading. We see that it hit a, a reading of 7%, which dates us all the way back you know, 40 years before we've seen, you know, a higher print than that. And as we have been talking, I believe a big reason for this elevated level of inflation is because of the backlog, where we see the backlog is also hitting, you know, very, very long-term highs here that we haven't seen in quite a while. And as long as this continues, I think we will continue to see a high CPI index. And one of the reasons why we see a big backlog, again, is very much covered in the financial press. We know that supply chains continue to be disrupted. We know um, infrastructure or at least uh, transportation of goods and services through shipping ports have been backed up for, for a long time now. We know of the ongoing uh, chip shortage that we've seen uh, for the auto industry. So these are all contributing factors in my view to the very high CPI reading that we're seeing. Uh, the price of used cars and trucks have gone up significantly because of this, um, where production is simply not able to meet with, to meet or catch up with demand. Um, and that's what's causing, you know, this very high CPI read that we see here. And we can see this chart, which overlays the backlog, which is again, the ISM manufacturing backlog um, versus the year-over-year -year growth in CPI. And you can see that both have surged together almost concurrently uh, you can almost see the backlog has a little bit of a leading uh, index, uh, a leading indicator to the CPI. Now we are starting to see it come down a little bit. So I think if this trend were to continue, then we may start to see the CPI ease a little bit in 2022. But I think a big portion of it is dependent on this backlog. So that's one thing that I think not enough uh, folks are talking about or keeping track of. So this ISM manufacturing backlog is probably the most important thing that I'm watching as a forward-looking signal um, on whether the CPI will start to ease a little bit or not. Um, we can also see similar, um, you know, issue with uh, regards to the demand side of the equation. So um, remember, the backlog is production um, minus, uh, you know, orders or demand. So supply minus demand. And we also want to make sure that the backlog is not coming down due to falling demand, right? Because that would be bearish for the economy um, for growth. So, but right now, at least as of right now, we see demands, you know, very, very strong. We see factory orders growing at a rate of 8.9% year over year. Um, we have now kind of eliminated the very negative comp, which was the depths of the COVID, you know, recession and the, and the lockdowns. So the year over year growth is pretty good because we're, you know, starting from a recovered base or at least a partially or mostly recovered base. Um, and we see that factory orders are now basically back at long term trend here. We see it, it's at roughly 9% year over year. That's actually slightly higher than what we saw basically throughout the 2000s, even exiting the Great Recession of 2008. We saw, you know, a period of very high bounce back, which is expected because of a very low base. But after that bounce back is completed, we actually kind of reverted back down to about 1.2% for many years. We even dipped negative for a time in 2015 uh, before recovering again. So we're at a pretty good point right now with factory orders. So the demand side of the equation looks pretty good. So these two things I would keep an eye on. If factory orders remain strong and if backlog starts to decline, that means that um, we are seeing production come back online which should then, you know, control uh, the CPI and see easing prices from that point on. So these are the these are two major things that I'm watching um, to make sure that you know we are on sound fundamental footing. What's a little bit concerning, however, are what is what the bond market is telling us. And we here we see a chart of the tens versus one ones, uh, you know, treasury spread, and we are starting to see uh, these yield, this yield curve narrow. Um, we saw it hit 1.5% um, again uh, towards the early part of 2021. That was a good trend to see because we really don't want to be seeing negative, um, you know, inverted yield curve. We want to see expanding 
uh, yield curve. Again, that's you know bullish for you know credit creation and credit demand, and that would also be a bullish sign of economic growth. But we're now starting to see that come down. So we saw it hit 1.5 percent in terms of the spread between the tens and ones. Um, that has now compressed down to 1.17. Not yet a cause for concern, but um, it's not a trend that we would like to see. Um, so hopefully that turns around. But this is another thing that I'm watching very carefully. Here's uh, a, another uh, spread: um, the 30s versus 10s. Uh, this is a little. This is even more pronounced. Um, we saw it hit a spread of 0.8 percent. That's about 80 basis points of a spread. That spread is now narrowed to about only 38 basis points. So this is a little concerning again. I see that this yield curve seems to be narrowing, which is fascinating because the CPI has never been higher. So during a time of inflation, it would make sense for long duration you know, treasuries to be yielding a lot more than short duration ones, right? So we would, we would need to be seeing increasing spreads and yet the exact opposite is happening. We're seeing narrowing spreads here. So what gives? One of these two must give. Either the CPI is actually going to come down or the bond market is calling it wrong and we're about to see significantly higher uh, yield spreads due to inflation, runaway inflation. I personally think that it's on the side of the bond market. You know, the bond traders are starting to see that despite the high you know, CPI index, this is signaling that there could be a growth slowdown on the horizon for 2022 if this trend were to continue. I still don't think it's necessarily a reason to panic just yet because we have been here before. Um, and so, like, for example, if we go back into the mid 90s, we saw, you know, a, a rapid recovery in the yield curve, just like what we saw right here. And then the yield spread started to narrow significantly. Um, almost dip negative, um, you know, briefly into in 1994 slash 95 before really stabilizing for the next five years. So you see this period right here. We could get a similar period like that where we see this narrowing spread, just like what we saw here in 1993, 1994. Um, and then really just some sideways action for the next five years. And that was, again, a very bullish time for the market. Um, the stock market had a, had a great string of you know five or six years in that time frame, so that could happen now, uh, where we see you know the the yield curve kind of you know you know trade in a sideways range for a, for a time. That would actually be very good to see. Um, so hopefully we do get that. But the yield curve right now it does not look like it's heading in the right direction. If we like if we zoom in a little bit more. Um, this data tells you that, you know, as of yesterday's close or as of the 23rd, uh, January 23rd, uh, the spread has narrowed even further as we see, uh, you know, the stock market get routed in the past week here, especially the high growth area of the market where, you know, multiples started to get to very, very sort of nosebleed, uh, you know, levels. Um, and now we've seen that spread tighten even more between 10s and 30s here. Now we're down to a spread of about 31 basis points. So again, not a very encouraging development. Um, this is indicating to me that growth is going to slow down, which means, you know, in part that factory orders will start to slow down. And if that happens, then the backlog will start to clear itself, but it's going to clear itself on reduced demand. So yes, the CPI should come down in that scenario, but it's not necessarily good for GDP growth because it's happening on less consumption. It's happening on a slowdown in demand. So this is a, another development that I'm watching very, very closely here is this uh, yield spread. And again, the other, another thing to watch too is that if inf inflation was here to stay, then tips should be performing much better than nominal treasuries. And right now tips are actually underperforming treasuries. Uh, you can see that the price of the TIP ETF has underperformed the IEF ETF. The IEF is the seven to 10 year treasury bond ETF. And the TIP is the, obviously the treasury inflation protected securities ETF. Um, in an inflationary environment, TIPS, the, the TIP ETF should actually be performing quite well. But here we see an underperformance versus even the nominal treasury bond ETF. So that tells you that bond traders right now are not really pricing in or not even expecting 
any kind of uh, an acceleration in inflation. To the contrary, uh, the bond market is saying that inflation is set to come down if this trend continues here. So again, another major thing to watch. Now, on the on the subject of valuation, um, a lot of people have been drawing parallels between today's market and the 2000s and the in the early 2000 bubble market. And I don't see the I just don't see that in the data. Um, in the in the late 90s slash early 2000s, we hit a forward PE in the S&P 500 of almost 26 times and traded somewhere between 24 and 26 for a period of you know almost two years, as you can see here. Today, the valuation is roughly 20 times forward earnings. It did get to almost that 24 mark at the very top. But since then, we've seen a very, very, you know, solid, you know, multiple compression in the market here. And I think it's just because of, of a garden variety correction that we're going through right now. So I don't think that PE multiples are, you know, are close to bubble territory, especially because just on an, on a nominal basis, we're much lower than, you know, the range that it traded at, at the very top. And that's on top of the fact that interest rates today are significantly lower than interest rates back then. Remember, uh, interest rates are sort of a proxy to the equity risk premium. The equity risk premium was much higher back then than it is today. And so with the equity risk premium much lower today than back then, and yet a lower nominal multiple, this tells me that you know we're nowhere close to uh, the multiples that were hit back then on an equity risk premium adjusted basis here. So I don't see any uh, evidence that we are in bubble territory with regards to multiples on the, on the, on the S&P 500. Definitely agree that there are bubbles in isolated areas within the, within the high growth, high beta space. We know of companies that you know, hit you know, enterprise value to sales multiples of 20 times or more, um, which is definitely not sustainable. That absolutely is bubble territory. But we're not seeing that systemic through the market. And as we can see here, I just don't see the evidence of that happening. And then if we go to other metrics like price to free cash flow, check out, check out where we are today. We're at almost 30 times a price to free cash flow for the S&P 500. That's basically right in line with the median over the past 25 years. So we're nowhere close to any kind of evidence that we're near a bubble you know, market. Um, we're significantly lower than even where we traded at in the mid 2000s here, in the late 2000s, uh, right before the great financial crisis occurred. So again, uh, this is more evidence that we are, you know, nowhere close to being in bubble valuations for the market overall. And remember, this is actually on the heels of exceedingly high free cash flow margins. Look at the margins that the S&P 500 companies are putting in. This is free cash flow margin. We're at roughly 16% right now versus you know the low teens to upper single digits that we saw throughout the late 90s you know um, bubble market and even throughout the 2000s here. So companies have fundamentally become much more efficient at translating every dollar of revenue down to free cash flow, which is the ultimate measure of the bottom line. Remember the you know free cash flow is the, the cash that the business generates from its operations after all cash expenses are, are considered. So it's better than earnings in my view, because it does not factor in accruals. So at the end of the day, how much cash did these companies generate? That's what free cash flow, you know, measures. And on that metric, we're now at a 16% margin. So that's the free cash flow divided by revenue. Companies are translating 16 cents out of every dollar of revenue. That's much better than we were where we at, you know, 10 to 20 years ago. So companies are getting much leaner today than they were during the 2000 market top. And at the same time, corporate balance sheets are very, very strong. You can see that net debt to EBITDA is basically at the low end of the range that we've been at for the last 25 years. Right now we're at 0.25. That's below the lowest levels that we saw during throughout the 1990s and 2000s. So, you know, corporate balance sheets have never been stronger, um, you know, where we see, you know, the leverage ratio, you know, as measured by the net debt to EBITDA, 
Net debt to EBITDA, by the way, is the preferred metric that the credit rating agencies use. Um, so this is the metric that, you know, Moody's and S&P uh, and Fitch, you know, mostly look at when assigning credit ratings. So the S&P as a whole has significantly delevered the balance sheet, you know, ever since in the, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009. So, you know, I see leverage risk at a historic low right now for the market. And lastly, we see shares outstanding as a fraction of where it once was. So all of these things are contributing to basically a floor being put underneath the market right now. S&P companies are leaner than they ever were before. Uh, leverage risk is at basically all time lows. And, you know, management um, has bought back a significant amount of stock um, over the past 10 years. So all of these factors are putting in essentially a floor um, in the market that's providing some long-term support. So whatever, uh, you know, tightening and whatever contraction we see in the market that we're, you know, experiencing, you know, at least over the past one week, I think is going to be bought eventually. So the, the basic reasoning, in my view, of why the market dropped so much this week um, is again, because the bond market is thinking that there may be a growth slowdown coming. And, you know, we're about to get the FOMC decision uh, coming here really soon today. Um, and, you know, they might be concerned that the Fed is starting to tighten right when growth is about to slow down. So that's one reason why the markets are concerned. Um, and lastly, uh, I think it's just looking for a reason to sell off because we've been rallying nonstop for two years. So the last time we had a bit, you know, even a correction in the market was, you know, basically back during the COVID crash. So we've been rallying nonstop for two years. So it makes sense for the market to take a breather. And right now, um, you know, this idea of the Fed tightening is the perfect reason for markets to cool off, you know, but because of these underlying fundamentals, in the long run, I think that this is going to set up for yet another buying opportunity uh, to go long the S and P five hundred as well as to go long the Zach's earning certain you know portfolio, you know for the next five years. So that's what I think what is happening right now. So this is the investment mindset that I think we should all have. You know, either we should be sticking to our guns and invest in these high revenue growth businesses that show a high rate of change in ROIC. Um, as long as they're experiencing secular growth and are attacking a very large total adjustable market and whose multiples have now come back in line with long-term averages. Remember, the big problem with high growth companies um, was that they traded at extraordinary multiples. So the forward-looking rate of return that would be expected would be very, very negative. Um, you know, because companies that trade at 20 times revenue I can't think of an example of a company that has come back to show good returns in the next year or so after achieving a 20 to 30 multiple on revenue. So, however, those multiples have not have now reversed themselves for the large part, you know, majority of these companies. We're now seeing companies that once traded at 10 or 15 times revenue now trade at three to four times revenue. Uh, you know, companies that traded at, you know, um, you know, 50 times gross profit now trade at 10 to 15 times gross profit. So these are much, much more reasonable uh, multiples that these high growth companies are trading at um, that we can use to compare versus historical high growth companies like Amazon and, um, you know, Microsoft and others like that. So I would look for these types of companies that have now reversed and come back to reality and are now trading at very attractive multiples um, relative to their growth rate. So that would be one approach. The other approach would be to stick to strong ROIC quality balance sheet companies with secular growth. So the common underlying theme here is just look for companies generating strong returns on invested capital. And the reason why this is so important is because ROIC uh, incorporates the three pillars of long-term value creation, right? We want to find highly profitable companies. We want to find fast growing companies, and we want to find high capital efficiency companies. ROIC measures all three in one metric. This is why it's such an important thing to have as a part of your overall investment strategy 
is uh, to always make sure that whatever stocks you're buying, they need to be showing either a strong ROIC today, or they need to be showing a strong rate of change in the ROIC. So this is what's usually the case for high growth companies. They may not have high ROIC today, but they should be showing a strong rate of change uh, going from negative to positive or going from low to mid. You know, for example, we see many companies that were once doing negative 10% ROIC that had become 0% ROIC and now that's 5% ROIC. That's a very strong and very positive rate of change. It tells you that companies have operating leverage and are moving towards high ROIC. That's very, very important to, to, to be watching. Or to be investing in mature companies, but have high and stable ROIC. So I would look for companies that have those types of characteristics. And ultimately, the, the last, you know, sort of, you know, investment mindset is that you're buying a business, you're not buying, you know, a, a number flashing across the screen. As long as you maintain that mindset that you're buying a business for the long haul, then, you know, what will happen is as long as these companies continue to earn a high ROIC, they are compounding capital at that high rate of return, which means that inevitably, the stock price will follow. It may have a period of a bear market. It may have a period of a correction. It may have a period where the macro factors outweigh the fundamentals. But in the long run, ROIC cannot be denied. That is the rate of return businesses generate on their own capital. And in the long run, that is what you earn on your investment. Even if you, play, you know, even if it appears that you paid a high multiple on it today. So that's the important mindset to be maintaining throughout all of this is that we need to be maintaining focus as a long-term investor in high quality, high secular growth, high uh, ROIC businesses that can sustain that mode for a very long time. So with that, I will conclude our session for today. Any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can see my contact info here on the screen. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, I'd love to hear from you guys. If you're a ZRS client, please do email us at zrs at zax.com. If you're an advisor tools client, please email us at zat at zax.com. Thanks everyone and hope to see you soon.